This is Coast AM. The time is nine o'clock and in the newsroom is Sue Flipping. The pirate ship Radio Caroline is unmanned this morning after an emergency airlift has saved three crew members. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams and Rico were winched to safety by a helicopter from RAF Manston as a converted trawler foundered in force eight to nine gales. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge have been getting steadily worse over the past few weeks. The crew members have had no fresh water for three weeks. They were running short of food and yesterday they lost their last stocks of petrol to power the generator. Conditions were too bad for the Coast Guards. Co-pilot on the helicopter, Jonathan Dixon, says the rescued people seemed in good spirits. They were relieved when, when, when we got them off. But a prepared statement from a Radio Caroline spokesman was less cheerful. For the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. Can police have questioned the three crew members? They've now been released. Um, are suffering an enormous amount of underfunding. They just couldn't get the cash to pay for what they needed. I think that has been the case with Radio Caroline for, for several years now, that uh, mm. money has not just been there. And uh, the fuel situation was particularly bad up until certainly two weeks ago. And uh, that petrol generator that you were talking about mm. earlier, in fact, from what I understand, it only used to run for two hours at a time anyway before it overheated. So, Good uh, Lord. So the yeah. conditions were very, very bad. It's like um, some of the equipment here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> Now, uh, let's just move on. And what else is happening this morning? It's Tuesday, 11th of December, with the news at 10, John Running. The pirate ship Radio Caroline is unmanned this morning after an emergency airlift to save three crew members. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams and Rico were winched to safety by a helicopter from RAF Manston as, they con con converted trawler founded, as the converted trawler founded in force eight to nine gales. This report from Sue Clipping. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge have been getting steadily worse over the past few weeks. The crew members have had no fresh water for three weeks, they were running short of food, and yesterday they lost their last stocks of petrol to power the generator. Conditions were too bad for the Coast Guards. Co-pilot on the helicopter, Jonathan Dixon, says the rescued people seemed in good spirits. I think they were relieved when, when, when we got them off. But a prepared statement from a Radio Caroline spokesman was less cheerful. For the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. Kent Police have questioned the three crew members. They've now been released. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams and Rico were winched to safety by a helicopter from RAF Manston as converted trawler foundered in force eight to nine gales. Here's John Brunning. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge have been getting steadily worse over the past few weeks. The crew members have had no fresh water for three weeks. They were running short of food and yesterday they lost their last stocks of petrol to power the generator. Conditions were too bad for the Coast Guards. Co-pilot on the helicopter, Jonathan Dixon, says the rescued people seemed in good spirits. I think they were relieved when, when, when we got them off. But a prepared statement from a Radio Caroline spokesman was less cheerful. For the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. Can police have questioned the three crew members? They've now been released. They were short of water and food. Last night, their last stock of generator fuel was washed overboard, leaving them without heating. More importantly, they couldn't power lights to warn off other vessels. It was decided to abandon the converted trawler for the first time in eight years. The seas were too rough, even for a lifeboat. Station manager Peter Moore says he can't praise the RAF highly enough. I understand the ship is rolling very badly, and uh, it can roll through an arc of 60 degrees when the weather's bad. And since there is so much metal up in the sky above the ship, aerial towers and um, aerial wire and rigging, yes, it was a, you know, a very skilled job. A salvage vessel is now on its way from Holland to make the ship safe. But with the vessel unprotected, the crew will also dismantle the onboard transmitter. It seems the government are so, um, so determined to get rid of Caroline, they're actually contemplating um, a change to international law to be able to do it. So our plan, of course, is not to transmit any longer. We're going to uh, keep the ship at sea while we consider our legal position. Mr Moore hopes the situation will be sorted out before the end of the month. In the meantime, he says spirits among the broadcasters is still high. He's already had several volunteers wanting to go back on board. The time is now one o'clock. This is Andy Jones at BBC Radio Kent. The latest news headlines. A rescue boat is due to leave Ramsgate Harbour about now to try to salvage the stranded pirate radio ship Radio Caroline. As Lawrence MacDonald reports, unless power can be restored on board the converted trawler, she will continue to be a danger to shipping off the Kent coast. The three-man crew on board the Ross Revenge were airlifted to safety last night as the vessel was battered by severe gales. The Coast Guard were called after the generator failed and the two men and a woman found themselves without light, heat or any food. A helicopter from RAF Manston brought them back to dry land just after midnight. 
and from there the crew were taken to Ramsgate Police Station. They were then released without charges. A spokesman for the Department of Trade and Industry said since no one's broadcast from the ship for several months, they committed no offence. An engineer is hoping to restore power to the ship and get the lights back on as soon as possible, so it's at least visible to other traffic in the area. Keepers winched to safety from the deck of the pirate ship Radio Caroline say they'd be happy to go back. They were forced to abandon the Ross Revenge by a power failure in heavy seas. The transmitter for the 26-year-old illegal station is now being dismantled. But station manager Peter Moore says he's had plenty of volunteers willing to go back on board. As an incident in the history of Caroline, it's not all that major. It might be a bit dramatic, but um, compared to some of the other things that Caroline's endured, it's very minor, so it's just a small setback. The transmitter from the pirate radio ship, the Ross Revenge, is being dismantled. The Radio Caroline trawler, anchored 15 miles off North Foreland, is unmanned following the dramatic rescue of three crew members. The station has been transmitting for 26 years, but manager Peter Moore decided against a confrontation with the Department of Trade and Industry at this stage. DTI are very determined to, to silence Caroline, and we fear that um, they may... Uh, they may shoot first and ask questions later, which obviously isn't very satisfactory from our point of view, so we don't wish to give them any reason to act while we, while we investigate our legal position. Just me and Caroline, Caroline, Caroline. Well, another sad day in the history of uh, the old radio station, dear old Radio Caroline, soft spot. Uh, all broadcasts have got a soft spot for it, particularly those that worked for it. You never actually forget where it all uh, started and just think that we wouldn't have any of the radio setup that we have today if it wasn't for those guys out there. Not only myself, but uh, a lot of others who've been out there as well. Before me and uh, since. Certainly the news looks bad today, but uh, you can't count them out. People are saying it's the end. They have a lot of fighting spirit, the people behind that organisation. <laughs> and who's to say they won't be back? Give them a licence. Bring them on shore. Come on. Do a lot of harm with it. Welcome to Atlanta Radio's look at the latest news from around the radio world. This is the Atlanta Soundabout, and I'm Tony Sullivan. We must, of course, start with the dramatic news from Radio Caroline. The story begins several weeks back when Caroline left the air on 819 kilohertz. It was originally stated that this was due to problems with the transmitter valve. However, the true reason was that once again, the lack of finances had resulted in there being no fuel for the generators once again. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge over the last few weeks were at an all-time low. There was no heating, cooking was done by Calagas, and fresh water supplies were very low. By the start of this week, the poor conditions on board had reduced the crew on board the Ross Revenge to just three people. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams, and Rico. Food and water were getting low, and supplies were being rationed. Then dramatically, during the night of Monday, the 10th of December, a severe northerly gale blew up with winds of up to force 10. The Ross Revenge began taking in water, and the lack of generator fuel meant that the pumps could not be run. The crew were left with no option other than to abandon ship. The crew contacted the Ramsgate lifeboat by Vodafone and requested to be taken off the boat as conditions on board were hazardous. However, Ramsgate considered that there was no immediate threat to life, and as they had several other more serious calls to attend to, they refused to attend to the Ross Revenge. A further call was made from the Ross Revenge to the RAF rescue station at Manston. It is believed that around this time, the DTI came alongside the Ross Revenge and shone its searchlight at the boat. At that time, the Ross Revenge was showing no light, and the only illumination seen came from a dim torch held by one of the crew on the bridge. Eventually, at around 9.30pm, the SC Rescue helicopter was launched from Manson, and the crew were eventually winched to safety. Here's how the local radio news reported the incident on the morning of Tuesday, the 11th of December. Right around the county on this Tuesday morning, the 11th of December, it's in Victor FM. Hello. Time is now 8 o'clock, and for the latest news, around the world and local, John Brunning. Three crew members from the pirate ship Radio Caroline have been winched to safety after putting out a mayday call. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams, Rico have spent the last few weeks rationing water and food. Last night, their power for heating and lighting failed completely. 
The converted stroller Ross Revenge was found in force eight to nine gales. In a prepared statement, a spokesman says the crew had to be brought off for their own safety. They stayed with Kent Police for some time, answering questions before finally being released. The Ross Revenge remains at anchor, riding out rather strong northeasterly winds. But for the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. The crew on board the pirate radio ship and Radio Caroline have been airlifted to safety after their vessel got into difficulties off Ramsgate last night. The Coast Guard was called after their generator failed. A lifeboat wasn't able to reach the ship because conditions were so bad, so a helicopter from RAF in Amsterdam eventually rescued the two men and a woman. Coast Guard senior watch officer Jim Lamb describes the difficult to rescue operation. This is a very bad, exceptionally bad, very heavy seas, and it wasn't an easy job for a other helicopter because of the large transmission masts aboard this vessel. So it wasn't a very nice job at all. What sort of conditions did this one have? Well, it's, it, there's no one aboard. It's a problem. It's a danger to navigation. And, um, you know, that's a busy sea line. It can be a busy sea line. And it's flying there on lip British hostages out of Iraq is continuing. Another 400 leave Baghdad today. A pirate radio ship abandoned off to Ramsgate is a danger to shipping. Dover Coast Guard say the Radio Caroline ship, which was abandoned last night when it got into difficulties, is now a danger to shipping in the channel. The two men and one woman crew were airlifted to safety after the generator failed in rough seas off Ramsgate. Coast Guard senior watch officer Jim Lamb said it's not anchored properly and is a serious hazard. This is Victor FM. It's 9 o'clock for the latest news now. John Brunning. The pirate ship Radio Caroline has unmanned this morning after an emergency airlift to save three crew members. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams and Rico were winched to safety by a helicopter from RAF Manston. The converted trawler founded in Fort 8 to 9 gales. Reports. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge have been getting steadily worse over the past few weeks. The crew members have had no fresh water for three weeks. They were running short of food, and yesterday they lost their last stocks of petrol to power the generator. Conditions were too bad for the Coast Guard. Co-pilot on the helicopter, Jonathan Dixon, says the rescued people seemed in good spirit. They were relieved when, when, when we got them off. But a prepared statement from a Radio Caroline spokesman was less cheerful. For the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. Kent police have questioned the three crew members. They've now been released. During the following day, Wednesday, the 12th of December, the Trinity House vessel Patricia arrived alongside the now abandoned Ross Revenge and put a team on board. They established that the vessel was empty and conditions on board were even worse than imagined. There was no fresh water, sanitation was non existent, and the fuel level was insufficient to generate any power whatsoever. Having examined the Ross Revenge, the Trinity House team then left. HM Coast Guards are currently putting out a regular warning to all vessels. The Ross Revenge is a hazard to navigation in the area. The Caroline organisation tried to get a crew out of the Ross Revenge, but even though the tender reached the ship, conditions meant that a boarding could not be made. A further attempt was planned. That's all the news we have from Caroline in the soundabout. However, Mark Stafford will have a full update on the very latest situation just before we close down today. Whatever happens in the next few days, it is certain that the new broadcast will mean serious problems for Caroline. Indeed, prior to the problems of the last few days, the station was in a sorry state, and even the most committed supporters were accepting that the future of the Radio Caroline as an offshore station looks bleak. The introduction of the new broadcasting bill on the 1st of January 1991 will of course not only affect Radio Caroline, it will also result in a drastic change to the world of land-based pirate radio. That's all the news we have from Caroline in the sound about. However, Mark Stafford will have a full update on the very latest situation just before we close down today. And here we are, Mark Stafford with a full update on the Caroline situation. We just heard Tony Sullivan's version of the news as at about uh, Wednesday night, updating it now as at uh, the early part of the weekend. The situation is that since the news we gave you, um, the Khan organisation got a boat out there on about Thursday, and uh, the boat could not get somebody on board due to the rough work weather. But later in the week, a successful attempt was made, and the latest news that we have is that Peter Chicago is now on board Russ Revenge.
I'm not sure. Can't seem to establish whether he's on his own or whether he has somebody with him. But one way or another, we wish him all the best. If the weather turns rough, we will be a very brave man out there. And just to give you a recap on how things are in general, the conditions on board up here are terrible. Probably the worst thing have been, well, by far I'd say the worst thing have been. Forget about the 1970s, the 78, 79 winter when it was supposed to be all bad. We're talking here about uh, no heating, no lighting, a little bit of fuel, a real struggle and um, a pretty awful place to be. So send your Christmas wishes out to Peter Chicago. Anyway, here's some music that uh, ex-Caroline DJ friend of mine, Chris Cooper, brought back to me once. <laughs> brought this uh, record back uh, on the tape of it and said, uh, this is something to do with uh, pirate radio. In fact, it's a record that Caroline used to play about the winter of 89. These are the Hooters. And let's hope this is true. Give the music back. We're going to be looking at Radio Caroline and the events over the last week. And I think we can start with Christopher England. On Monday the 10th at around 11 o'clock in the evening, the crew of Rico, Chris Adams and Caroline Martin abandoned the ship Ross Revenge and they were winched to safety by a Sea King helicopter. For the past few weeks, life on board the Ross Revenge had become increasingly more and more difficult as the stock of supplies had slowly dwindled due to successful DTI activities against the organisation and the underfunding that was happening as the reality of the new powers granted by the Broadcasting Act became more and more obvious to the Caroline organisation. Rico, who had been on the ship for nearly six continuous months, was in charge and he watched as the stock slowly got used up. Despite his request for essential supplies, he received replicated orders of loads and loads of non-essential supplies. Finally, the broadcasting crew slowly evolved into a caretaker crew, struggling to keep the ship just functioning and existing. Meanwhile, pre-prepared scripts from Caroline management read unquestioningly over the CM info line indicated that all was cheery and bright. Two weeks ago, Neil and Alex left the ship to be replaced by Chris Adams. They were immediately threatened that should the truth about the real state of the Ross Revenge be revealed, they would be in serious trouble. The main diesel generators had failed a long while ago, with the huge lorry type batteries unable to take any charge. With no battery power, they were unable to run the starter motor to get the generator turning again. A small quantity of diesel was delivered, but it was of no use without the starter batteries. Without the main generator, there was no heat and no standard lighting. Even gas canisters delivered to the Ross turned out to be less than a quarter full. For some time, the crew had been confining themselves to the bridge, running a small Honda petrol generator on deck, which produced just enough power to run a single bar fire and a string of light bulbs, some of which were outside to light the ship at night for navigation purposes. When a film crew boarded the ship to take the Thank you. 
kindly by all involved. All three commented that the very basic snack food that had been provided by Kent Police had been the best they had seen for months. They spent most of Tuesday resting with hosts who had been given strict instructions to forbid them from talking to any media or those who had been decreed undesirable. They were to be told that their actions were intolerable and had caused unnecessary complications for the Caroline organization. Rico was fearful that his clothes and possessions would be thrown overboard to teach him a lesson, and Chris Adams was very worried about acts of retaliation for deserting the ship. A bland, everything is all right, really, script from the Caroline management was then read out on the CM info line, suggesting that a salvage boat was heading towards with a replacement crew who would sort everything out, allowing everything to return to the imaginary happiness again. The script turned his attention to attacking the Dover Coast Guard, who had expressed concern over the unseaworthy condition of the rough revenge. Seeing the fear in Caroline Martin's eyes, who at the time of this recording is still shaking uncontrollably, can only agree with this news line in its praise for the work and the natural concern that the Coast Guard expressed about human beings being allowed to suffer in such a terrible way.
wondering just what the future holds for Radio Caroline. And I know there have been a lot of rumours in the last uh, online few weeks, the last few months, quite honestly. Uh, many people have asked just what is likely to happen and how things might come about. And I know a lot of people have heard stories about meeting with the enemy in inverted commas. And uh, why all these terrible people have sold out to the authorities and have turned both sides. Well, um, it, it's about time, quite honestly, that uh, one or two of these bits and pieces actually come out in the open and, and uh, we get the opportunity to tell what exactly is going on. Because... Uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's been described to me as um, the sort of situation you get in when, when a, a close friend of the family is dying of, of a sort of terminal disease or whatever, and uh, I guess everybody gets very emotional, um, very upset, very frustrated or whatever, and it leads to uh, all kinds of problems, and that really is what's been happening to Caroline over the last uh, six months or thereabouts. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think um, <coughs> my, uh, my feelings about it really can be traced back to uh, last Christmas, uh, almost a year ago now, and um, I know when uh, when I just uh, returned from the function then, um, I uh, sat down with uh, Chris England. I'm sure many people listening to this radio station uh, know quite well. And uh, he'd been sort of talking to me about various things. And uh, we'd uh, we just returned from a, a special Christmas uh, party which the Caroline Booth has uh, organised uh, on board their, their vessel, the MV Galaxy. And uh, a lot of uh, places had come together. It was actually an attempt to bring together as many people as possible from the organisation to try and uh, sound out the future and uh, sort one or two things out in some sort of direction. And, uh, for example, it's been nice to see uh, people like uh, uh, Peter Chicago and uh, Chris Carey and Peter Moore all together talking quite merrily again, um, which uh, was certainly an achievement as far as I was concerned. But when I returned to Chris's, we were up until the early hours of the morning discussing this. And I actually said there and then that I really didn't think that we would ever see another Christmas with Caroline. And uh, I guess that was the turning point for me. That was the point at which I admitted I really thought that, that there was no way off. But of course, we didn't know what on earth was ahead of us then. Um, but there was no inkling that the fight with uh, Spectrum Radio and the, uh, the fight in the laws with the, uh, the, the progress of the broadcasting act uh, it is now uh, would be foreseen. And of course, on top of that, the, uh, the actual trials and tribulations out of board the ship, the problems that were likely to be encountered in trying to keep the ship alive were, were just really science fiction at that time. Nobody really uh, understood just how bad things were going to get. And as the months went on, it became quite clear that things were becoming fairly serious. Now, when this began to affect the Caroline movement itself with the sort of polarisation of communication and contact, that then started to, to, to rub off on the supporters. And frankly, um, I think it's only fair to say that if it had been for the supporters of the radio station, the, the real listeners and supporters that have been there for all these years, then quite honestly, Caroline would never have been able to carry on as long as it has now, even to be out there at this, this very day. So um, it, it was those people that really had the future of the station in their hands. Without them, it couldn't have gone off. And uh, when it became clear that there was an, an off path, if you like, between the two sides of the operation, the, the people that were involved in the day-to-day -day running, who themselves have become volunteers, there are no fully paid-up full-time members of staff at all anymore, and the, the supporters, um, then it, it became clear that one or other had to take the initiative. It's very difficult. It's like switching off a life, life support system. You know, you, you just don't like to do it because you've been part of it for so long that to switch it off is just so difficult to do. But somebody somewhere had to take the initiative, otherwise the thing would just go. And the spirit that we, we call Caroline wouldn't be there. So um, I just actually traced it back to almost an exact date. Uh, it was actually June the 22nd of this year when I decided to write my first ever letter. I've never written a letter to any member of authority ever before. And, uh, uh, I mean, I've, I've watched the way that campaigns and pressure groups and lobbying have, have taken place over the years with the Euro siege and all sorts of other things. And I, I guess I've formulated a fairly good idea of how the, the politicians' minds work. And uh, to me, the, the supporters were doing a wonderful job, and, and we proved that with the, uh, uh, the Battle of the Lords. With, I mean, I know it, it may not sound like a very good victory, but 29 votes to 93 from, from literally happening to 93 was really quite spectacular. So that was a effort and just proved what can be done and how much support Caroline does have. But having said that, of course, um, you know, something had to be done. So an appeal was made from a humane angle following an article that appeared in the Independent newspaper. Some of you may have seen it where David Meller, who was then the uh, uh, minister uh, for the Home Office, uh, made it known that he was prepared to listen to reason thought about the, uh, the, the, the Marine Offence Act amendments to the Broadcasting Act, and that uh, if it was felt any of them were too severe, he would be prepared to look at them. And that's just what, uh, in fact, uh, it was decided to try and appeal to and to try and get across the humane angle of the people that support Caroline. Uh, again, on the commercial side of the thing and, and the, the possible sort of terrible pirates side of it, we wanted to try and appeal to 
main idea. These guys and girls have worked through just about everything out there uh, in horrible conditions. You know, disasters, masks coming down, anti-tanks, anti-tanks, things ripped to shreds, you know, lack of supply. Um, just trying to keep a radio station on air against all odds to do the one thing that they enjoy, and that's to listen to some good music. And that was the angle that, that we were trying to appeal to for once, not the, the propaganda war. That wasn't important anymore. We both know how to play that game. But it's just to appeal to, to the, the powers that be that, you know, we just wanted to, wanted to do something that we really enjoyed and really believed in, and that was all there was. And it worked, um, basically. Um, uh, David Mellor decided to pass on uh, the communication to his agency, which is now known as the Radio Communications Agency, what we originally knew as the DTI's Radio Interference and Radio Investigation Service. Uh, it's now a government agency, um, also still based at Waterloo Bridge House. And uh, as his agency in that division, he instructed us to make contact and to uh, start discussions. It took several months to do that, but um, eventually, uh, came to a situation where a meeting was organised on October the 1st um, with, uh, in fact, five members of the Radio Communications Agency headed by Barry Maxwell, who is the director of the agency, is actually in charge of the agency. Uh, he's also, I can say, in charge of Mr Murphy as well. Uh, Jim Murphy you know, told him what to do and what not to do. Um, and uh, an equal number of members of the Caroline Movement Central Organising Team placed them across the table in conference facilities uh, and a very amicable and very positive and I mean that, it really was. Um, it, it, they couldn't have tried harder to make us feel at home and at ease, and um, as a result, uh, we, we sat down and had discussions about all sorts of possibilities. And believe you me, any of the stories you may have heard about selling secrets and, and the DJI getting out their checkbooks and, and, and finding out the details they may not have had are absolute, complete, total nonsense. All the meetings are minted, um, they've actually been uh, written down, and uh, all of those details are available to anybody who wants to see the proof and the evidence of what was discussed. And basically, um, it was considered that uh, what, what, was, what we were looking for, everybody knows that the real reason that Caroline is what it is, and any offshore station for that matter is that it is an offshore station. The sea is unique, it's got that spirit about it, that spirit of adventure. And obviously any future Caroline, um, you know, would be seen to not be Caroline, and then have some sort of unique spirit about it, something different, something unusual compared to another radio station. And what we were aiming to do was to find some way or other of involving the, the radio ship Ross Revenge, Caroline's most important asset and her home. And the idea was to try in some way or other to uh, seek agreement for the Ross Revenge to avoid the fate of other radio ships so that it didn't end up being cut up from scrap or being sold or destroyed in some way or other. We wanted her to be safe. And um, without going into too many details, that certainly was something that we, we began to, to formulate uh, possibilities of. And, uh, as the weeks have gone on, um, one or two things have happened um, without going into detail, which has sort of unfortunately blurred the issue in many ways. And it got to the point, obviously, where the Ross Revenge itself was, was just battling on and on and on, trying to get it together. And while, you know, in, from a professional point of view, the people who were running the ship on a day to day basis were trying hard not to reveal the truth about the ship, it came to the point where it just had to be known. And unfortunately, uh, an incident took place which brought that all to the fore, and uh, I'm sure you know that uh, I'm talking about the incident that happened this Monday, where, of course, uh, the three remaining crew members uh, were removed by a helicopter from the ship. Now, they're all very young, they're in their early 20s, um, one of them's a girl anyway, um, and quite frankly, on a 970-ton uh, ocean-going vessel with no power uh, of any sort whatsoever, not even sort of auxiliary power, therefore no heating, uh, very little food, uh, virtually no water at all, in fact no water as such, um, and, and literally no facilities at all in a 49 northeasterly gale, uh, with no no power for main engines, uh, with an anchor chain, which, which in itself is something, I don't know if you're aware or not, but the, uh, the fixing for the anchor chain, uh, which is mounted on, on the top of the forepeak of the ship, is actually has made it clear that he was a little bit concerned about the condition it was in. So that in itself would be bound to worry anybody on board. And, you know, you, you can see it's a recipe for disaster. No means by which to communicate with land through the normal channels, through the normal marine channels. And there was just no alternative. Um, the, the crew had to leave the ship. And when it gets to the point where desperation within an organisation is such that you leave a ship manned by only three, you know, inexperienced, unprofessional sea people um, who could very easily have been killed. Um, and, and, of course, not only that, you're actually um, causing possible hazard to other going first. I mean, the, the vessel unlit in that location could have been that well, in fact, was a very serious hazard to uh, other vessels. And some very searching uh, um, sort of discussions had to take place as to why the situation didn't allow to get this far. 
There is a consequence for all this. Um, uh, it, 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 in fact, was necessary over the last few weeks to try and somehow or other get together. And with the two sides effectively doing separate things, the, the organisation behind the ship trying hard to get the thing back on air for whatever reason, and then the other team um, trying to, to formulate plans for a future licensed radio Caroline. Um, it was inevitable that at some stage the two had to try and, and cross paths and get back together and again and try and aim for a common goal. Now that's not been an easy process, uh, still isn't an easy process, but um, it had to happen and uh, it is true to say that um, a certain amount of uh, quite talking has had to go on in order to try hard to, to do that. Um, the other difficulty has been, and this is, this is really where the support has come in, because um, as you know the Caroline movement has been um, uh, accepting donations from uh, people who wanted to see uh, a legal battle take place to try and uh, get some sort of recompense for the action that took place on Norman when the ship was raided. And uh, this has been going ahead in very good faith, and as you will know, if you remember the Caroline movement, has been following the development since it's had a, a good deal of success. It's certainly been a very good publicity uh, event, if nothing else. However, um, the difficulty was that some weeks ago, um, various members of the team that were formulating proposals for the licence operation began to come across information which made it clear that uh, the whole legal basis upon which the, uh, the fight was being put together was coming apart at the scene. And in offshore radio, uh, and indeed in all forms of, of free radio, whether it's land-based or offshore, trust is a very important part of the, the way things work. Uh, without trust within the individuals that are involved, because things have to be operated on a clandestine basis, you just can't go on. You need to be able to trust your fellow, fellow operators. Um, and this trust has obviously been eroded. It was quite clear that uh, uh, facts about what was really going on behind the scenes uh, were, were not being revealed. And uh, after all, the, uh, the money that was being raised by all these fans, it was felt that they certainly had a right to know a, a little bit more about what was going on than was. And, and after all, if, if it's been revealed that certain particular bits were inaccurate, how were the people involved to, to know that the rest of the information they were provided with was also not inaccurate? So the, uh, the, the situation came, as I say, when uh, the two piles had to, uh, had to collide, I suppose is the best way of describing it, and that's really what's been happening in the last uh, 14 days or so. Uh, matters have come to a head now, and um, the radio ship itself um, has... Uh, uh, and it's uh, without the protection of a foreign country, um, then obviously they will find themselves in all sorts of trouble. Yeah, yeah. So that seems to be the general situation as we speak now. That's the sort of general round up as it stands. Yes, it's hard to stand, but somebody pointed out to the other world that it's been. It's the first time for seven, seven years now, seven Christmases, that Caroline has not been on the air. Yeah, I mean, the, the old Ross has done very well when you came back and you know, well, it was off, say, 78, and then came back on in 79. Yeah, it's good, it's good. Of course, things were pretty bad then. People say that this is a loss, but believe me, in those days, it was as bad. Um, it's just, it was bad. It's just the same as the, um, the Bob Knox book as well, and the 73s of yeah, the Yeah, oh, that's it. Yeah, 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 that's it. The major problem now is they don't have any backing. But that, that, that as before, you know, in, in days gone by, in the late 70s and the early 70s, there was always a chance that, that money could be found and always was found. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't think, you know, the problem is it, it, it's, it's money is not around anymore. That is the problem. And uh, without money, of course, you can't do a lot. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll just be quite happy to, to keep it at anchor at the moment. And uh, Trinity House did say uh, to a colleague of mine at uh, North Fallen Radio that um, the anchor chain um, is not in very good condition and of course it hasn't, uh, as far as I know, been replaced uh, properly uh, since about 1988. It's been very nearly three years, in fact, uh -huh, uh -huh. since they did any, any major work on the anchor chain, as far as I know. Um, they've probably done some, some minor work in, on, on the links and so forth, but obviously the main chain uh, beneath the surface of the, of, the, of the sea is obviously in a very uh, corroded uh, state by now, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, some interesting facts have recently come to hand concerning the flagging and registration of the MV Ross Revenge. Yes. Um, a recent fact message, well in fact uh, it's very, very recent, um, yes, of this month anyway, uh, from the uh, Chief of the Legal Department of the Republic of Panama, confirms the following details relating to the claimed Panamanian registration of the MV Ross Revenge. The first fact we received was that 
time now, Panama has been taking measures against the members of the Envy Ross Revenge and in January 1987 cancelled the ship's registration papers. The Panamanian authorities have been informed several times that the vessel has continued to illegally use the Panamanian flag. These Panamanian sources also stress that they recently appealed to the UNCAD Transport Department and the UK Transport Division to take any actions possible as it seems there is no other way to stop this vessel's activities. A further fact stated Tuesday 8th of January 1991 states that in February 1984, the Republic of Panama requested the mortgage holder, uh, which is somewhere in Zurich, to cease operations from the vessel MV Ross Revenge within 60 working days as requested by the law. No response from Zurich on this. Uh, in 19 November 1985, by means of resolution blah blah blah, uh, the Panamanian authorities ordered the deletion of the vessel. And, uh, oh, too much mod, too much mod. Delete, deletion of the vessel, and uh, I've lost my place, yes, and instructed the Panamanian consul in London to do so and proceed with the dismantling of the radio station. Ah, yes, this is where it gets interesting. In the two cases that existed at the time, MV Ross Revenge and the communicator. Ah, communicator effective as well. Didn't know that. The consul informed the Panamanian authorities that the Admiralty Marshal of the Royal Court of Justice had advised them not to execute the order because the communicator was in the process of a judicial sale and that mostly, most probably, the same situation might exist for the Ross Revenge. Very complication. Another resolution, uh, 12th of January 1987, uh, the Panamanian authorities ordered the cancellation of the registration of the Ross Revenge. So there you are. So that means, basically, that um, well, if a ship's not registered, right, and it's on the high seas, then you can quite legally, under maritime law, board it and take whatever you want, and in fact take the vessel as well. That's the way it is. If it's not registered, it's not protected. The legal representatives did not acknowledge the notification and the Panamanian authorities proceeded to notify this cancellation by means of public meetings. Oh, shall we carry on? Why not? On the 1st of August 1990, the Panamanian authorities asked their consul in London to confirm deletion of this vessel in relation to inquiries made by Mr. and Mrs. A.J. Raymond from Shrewsbury. What, uh, where are they going? Uh, sta <laughs> station manager quite... Uh, Puzzled on this one, yes, uh, we're putting up some exciting new elements in this uh, very long monologue. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. A.J. Raymond from Shrewsbury, good uh, afternoon to you. Uh, anything else that's interesting? Well, basically, what we're saying is it wasn't registered um, when the uh, Dutch incident happened, and so, therefore, there's not really a case, as far as I can tell, that can be presented against the Dutch other than maybe that they were a bit heavy-handed uh, with certain um, members of staff on board at the time. I think they were a bit heavy-handed. That is about it. You know, the Dutch were quite within their rights to board the ship and uh, do whatever they wanted at the time because it wasn't registered in Panama. So, to summarise then, to summarise, yes, we're nearly at the end. Uh, the MV Ross Revenge did not have a flag at the time of the raid. It was not registered in Panama or anywhere else. Um, it does not have a flag now. In fact, it doesn't even have a radio station now. In fact, I think it's been left empty, the last thing I heard. Uh, so it's not registered now. It's just basically a hulk. About uh, 15 miles off the southeast coast of England, I believe it is anyway. Um, does the DTI know this information? Yes. So, if you're a DTI officer, which you may well be, one or two of you may be listening and you want your own ship to sail around the world, we well, you know where it is. <laughs>